Hi, Christine. Good Hi, afternoon. Good morning in Boston. So this is our first remote interview. And thank you very much for spending your time with us and answering some burning questions <laughs> from our artists in the community. First off, can you uh, introduce a little bit the Beacon Gallery and what you do? Sure, with great pleasure. So I'm Christine O'Donnell. I founded Beacon Gallery in the south end of Boston back in 2017. This is a gallery that I run by myself. So I'm the sole owner and operator of it and generally curate all the shows, although I will bring in guest curators from time to time. Uh, we are focused on uh, social equity and social justice. We are in a neighborhood that has a lot of other galleries, so it's a really great place to be. How many artists you represent currently and what are their styles or stages? Oh, sure. So we are a contemporary art gallery and we tend to represent a lot of uh, emerging artists. We have some that are have made a little bit more progress in their career, but I didn't want to jump in too much to kind of like full on like blue chip artists or anything too intense when I started the gallery. I really wanted to go for people who were looking to get some support right at the start of their careers. So we went with a lot of um, emerging artists, mostly in the Boston area, although we do have some, we have some international and some from around the US as well. And I would say I try to keep myself to around 20 artists because it's really hard to support more than that, I find. So what kind of, let's say, services or support that you give to the artist? I would say, first of all, showing their work on a regular basis. Also maintaining a website where you're kind of coming to their work and trying to make sure that everything is up to date just keeping in contact with them. I mean, if you think about how many friends do you have that you're able to keep in touch with, right? I would guess it's probably not more than 20. It is really hard to just keep in touch with all these people. And I would say I have the most conversations and am in the most frequent contact with those who have shows coming up or who have a show that's just finished. And so there's this rotation, but I will be talking to other artists if we've had inquiries about their work or um, if we have other side projects going on, if we have questions or concerns or anything like that. But I found that it just gets to be overwhelming if there are too many artists on board. And for my own sanity, I can't cope with that. So did you bring a lot of them to the fairs? And how do you choose which ones to bring? I have gone to a couple of art fairs we showed at spring break. I'm actually going back to Aqua, I hope, if they select me. They've been very slow in making their choices this year. How do I choose? I think part of it is instinctual. I went and have, visit, have been visiting art shows for many years before I actually decided to bring some art down there. And I think that's something that's really important is kind of getting a sense of what art is being shown there and what sells and making sure you're A, not bringing like, let's say the exact same thing as someone else, but at the same time, bringing something that's, let's say, within the wheelhouse of interest to the people who are attending the show. So Aqua is mostly contemporary art. It tends to have a little bit of more of like a niche or like a, a alternative flair than the more um, established uh, fairs or like the big boy that is um, Art Basel, Miami Beach. And so you can get away with something that's like a bit more interesting and unique. So I brought Raquel Fornasaro's work down. She has a series of zoomorph pieces. She's a Brazilian artist who lives in the U.S. now. And her zoomorph series are children with animal heads on top. These are very finely done um, oil paintings. Um, we managed to sell one of her pieces and then a few other small works as well. So it's very successful, I would say. We made a lot of contacts. And that's the other thing is like, how do you measure success at, at an art fair. Is it going to be sales or can you do it another way? Just to go back to how many artists I deal with, um, we do have shows that are um, invitational shows or calls for art. And so it's not like you'll only ever see like these 20 artists at the gallery, that you do have other artists that kind of like come and go. But I guess I'm talking about like the, the artists that I end up representing. When you select artists for art fairs or art shows, uh, would you prioritize artists who would say could help in logistic or financial ways? 
Honestly, I would say no. Although certainly anything that an artist can do to help logistically um, would be welcome. Financially, I never ask artists to contribute. Sometimes um, if an artist wants to do something that's it, let's say is like beyond what I'm planning to do, like take out a magazine ad, then they're, they're welcome to do that. And I won't certainly won't stop them. But um, that's kind of like more their their own thing, I would say. In terms of like when we go down to an art fair, I am going to select the work that I think is going to fit the show the best and am not considering what else is happening. Now, funnily enough that you say that, the three artists that I am bringing down this year to Aqua are Ibrahim Ali Salam, Sima Schloss, and um, Jamal Thorne. Ibrahim and Jamal are both Boston artists. Sima Schloss is from New York, so none are Miami-based. But Ibrahim actually happens to be my art installer as well. I am highly encouraging him to come down a few days in advance with me and help me install the show because it's a lot of work to do it on your own. But I know many galleries would ask their artists to kind of chip in for a very expensive show, especially international show. Um, that's why I ask, how do you think of such practice? I don't like that idea. If a gallery can't afford to provide an international show on their own, then they should not be doing the international show, in my opinion. So there are some galleries that are co-op galleries. Now, if a co-op gallery wants to go and, and under the guise of that gallery, let's say three artists from there want to use the brand and say, we want to go and take this brand um, and go to an international show. Then, then, of course, the three of those artists can split the cost and use the brand and, and go and do their thing. But if I would not be comfortable asking anyone, any artist, to, for money for a show. It's, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's not how I work, and it's, it feels um, self-serving. And already, like, that's just not how the business model is. I mean, like, you have different business models. If You can't kind of, like, get artists coming and going. Like... If you want to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to contribute up front and then you get a hundred percent of the proceeds if we sell anything like that might be different. The idea is that I put in all the cost up front. I am fronting all the funds. I'm taking on all the risk and then they're offering me 50% of the proceeds for anything that sells, but they don't owe me anything if nothing sells. That's kind of like the trust that we're putting into the system and that's why they're willing to give me that money if something sells. That's kind of like how this how this all works. I have I'm putting in all the risk. They have no risk. And that's one of the in a way what I kind of like about it though for the business is that I can provide that platform for them that they don't have to take risk. They don't have to take out, they don't have to rent out a space in Boston to show their work and to have people see it. You know, they can have their little studio somewhere and and still have an opportunity for people to see their work. In the end, if if we're successful and someone does want to take one of their pieces home, yes, there is there's a you know a price to pay, but but that's only if something good happens. If not, you know, if 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 only good things like people coming in and ooing out in eyeing over the work happens and making some connections and things like that happen, then at the end of the day, they really shouldn't be out of pocket very much. You just mentioned unless it is a co-op gallery and mm -hmm. you did mention different sort of business models. So how do you define your gallery? Obviously, you said it's um, provoking social changes, but at the same time, it is not a co-op gallery. It's more of a traditional classical gallery business model, but with a chaos, with a purpose. How do you define it? Sure. So I'm, I'm a commercial gallery. So I'm a kind of like a for-profit model and not in the traditional sense of like, I'm here like rubbing my hands together wanting money, but more so in the sense that it's um, being a nonprofit, which, and I also have a nonprofit as well, requires a whole other set of structures where you have to have your guiding documents and you have to have like a group of people who are involved in annual meetings and things like that. You're much freer when you're just a, a, a LLC or a for-profit enterprise, which is what I am. And so I can just be like my one-man band and decide what I want to do. And, and I like it that way. A, a co-op gallery is when you have a group of people who all essentially 
it's it's kind of like the same thing if you have a group of people who all live in the same building, right? And they all co-own the building. It would, you know, you would co-own the gallery and essentially you would all say, okay, let's say there are 12 people, right? We'll each pay one month rent and we'll each pay and we each get one show a, a year. And most galleries have like, let's say 36 artists instead of like 12. And you're only going to get a show once every three years or something like that. And then there are a couple, they, it's much more complicated than like one out of every 12. But, but that's the, essentially the idea is that you're, you're dividing up the tasks and conquering instead. Um, you are taking on some of the financial risk. Um, but at the same time, you're also not necessarily going to have to split the rewards if you sell something with a partner who owns the gallery. Um, you may have to contribute or you're going to be contributing a portion to rent and to the overhead and to, you're going to have to contribute time as well. So there are going to be gallery sitting hours where you're expected to actually go in. And you're going to have to have meetings because it's going to be meeting and deciding things in a group, which can also be frustrating if you don't all agree. Yes. And you mentioned risks. And that's something I think not every artist understands the risks and the business overhead, like an art show could cost easily twenty, thirty thousand dollars mm -hmm. And even just to get in is easily 20,000 US dollars just to be there. And then installation, the transport, uh, labor and um, insurance, taxes and all of that. It's a lot of money. And not every artist understands that and saying there's a, you can see that online, a lot of people say, oh, why a gallery is taking 50%, you know, it's a lot of mm -hmm. money, you know, obviously many artists are willing to work with galleries because that 50% is well worth it. So what kind of, let's say risks and what other business overhead that you are, you are like confronted every day? Like there's the financial risk, first of all, and, and that's the biggest one in terms of overhead. And you have, I mean, just having the space, right? That's a huge financial burden that I'm putting upon myself and obligation. There's a reason that most galleries don't make it to three years. It's because it's this is a really tough business, as most artists know. And in a way, the artists are much more likely to make it long term than the galleries are. The fact that like if you persevere as an artist, like you can make it because all you need are like your paintbrush and your canvas or whatever your materials are. But a gallery in a way needs that space. I mean, yes, you can be an online gallery at some point, but um, there's nothing like a brick and mortar space to really offer a sense of authenticity and uh, for people to trust that you know what you're actually doing. So you have that risk and and in terms of like what else costs a lot of money, like insurance and your platform and um, personnel, those are all like some of the big costs. Outside of that though, I would say that, that artists don't understand how much time and effort people like me put into what we do. I mean, I have put my heart and soul into my business for the past four years and I am always on. Um, there are very, very few times where I'm not like on my email, checking things, talking to people like you, working on marketing, working on sales, thinking about new shows. It is like a, it turns into a 24 seven job if you're doing it right. Um, or maybe if you're doing it wrong, I don't know, maybe I should have more, <laughs> more of like a boundary <laughs> in my life. And I do, you know, I have a family and, and I have children and I definitely spend time with them. So I don't want anyone to kind of feel bad for me or think this is all I do. I worked a heck of a lot on, on this and, um, it is like my baby and, and the way I curate the shows and um, certain catalogs I've, that I've written are, you know, I work a ton on this stuff. It's just different work than creating art. But even that artists had not as much sunk cost as a gallerist, still, according to the national survey that I've read in the BFA, MFA, PhD.com, and a lot of people actually used this data as a reference, 90% um, of art school graduates 
don't make a living from making art. Why do you think is that? What has been stopping artists from succeeding from a gallerist point of view? There are a couple things that are going on there. Um, I think part of it is how we as a culture consume art. And so I'm not sure if we are literally if we're buying enough art as a society. Um, I think there is a desire to get art really cheap. I think there's a lot of very ex inexpensive reproductions. You can go to Home Goods or Ikea and just get something for your wall. And so people don't have this desire to buy original artwork and, and to make that effort to do so. Um, because there is fabulous original artwork out there if you're willing to put in the effort. And I'm not saying that you need to come to a gallery and spend $10,000 on it. Um, you can find interesting things at very reasonable prices, um, direct from the artist or from small galleries and build up a collection. But, but we as a society, are that's not where we put our effort and that's not what that's not something we value and so that is part of the problem and it also is just like anything else let's say if we use like a sports analogy you're you know everyone plays soccer everyone plays basketball or football as a kid and you're only ever going to have like a few who make it to the big leagues because we don't have a lot of people consuming art and because most art is going to be purchased at pretty low prices it's just not a model that's going to allow for a lot of people to make their livings doing it. And unfortunately, we are, you know, who's making a really good um, living, though, are the people who are pumping out fine art degrees. So you have like all these schools like Yale and the School of Museum of Fine Arts and what have you. And they are more than happy, though, to get people in for a Bachelor of Fine Arts or a Master's of Fine Arts knowing that there are no careers out there for these people. It's the purpose of the education just to have a successful financial life for their, you know, it's not a business degree, right? So <laughs> art degrees are in a way made for families who can afford it. And at the same time, there's always going to be that like one or two people who come out of there who are absolute superstars. And you say to yourself, well, that could be me. And you can learn a lot through those programs. I'm not trying to, to say that those programs are useless. I'm just saying that there's this, I think, a disconnect between um, what we kind of offer to our students in terms of like preparing them for the real world in terms of like maybe when they're coming out of school, when, we're, when they're in the fine arts program. If you want to get trained to make art the right way or the Yale way and Yale is where like let's say um Pace Gallery and Gagosian and like all the big blue chip galleries that's like where they're going to find find their new artists right they're like you know high potential artists is out of schools like that and only only these the, the richest people can kind of like afford to get the training they need to become the, these great artists and that's what we've seen in the past and you know, hopefully that will not continue. I feel like there's, there is like financial aid and there is a sense of like trying to offer support to others. And I try to like dig deep and look around and, and see, you know, I don't care if my artists have gone to art school or not. That's like the, the last thing that I think about. They worry about it. If they're making something that's interesting, like that's all I care about. You are as a gallerist, you're trying to, in a way, change the situation. Not only the top 1% sent their kid to uh, Yale Art School could go to Gagosian and Pace Gallery and succeed and become a million dollar artist. You're trying to work with artists who are from, let's say, not necessarily art school or private schools or you know, with uh, excellent education. You do not mind and you work with all sorts of artists. But you can only say yes maybe ten times a year. Oh, so many times. You're you're right though that I have to say no a lot more than I have to say than I get to say yes. It's true. Who should be working with galleries? When I mean galleries, I don't mean of course I don't mean the only the top like pace sure. gallery like kind of gallery. gallery. I mean, yeah, yeah like a beacon gallery or other commercial galleries. Who should be pitching themselves into those galleries? Well, I'll tell you what I find often is the case is that people think that once they start making art, 
that the next step is to come and talk to me. And that really isn't the next step. You don't kind of like make art and then like go talk to a gallery. And so oftentimes I find artists who are not kind of like ready to talk to galleries want to, want to come and talk to me. Um, people who should be coming to talk to me are people who have gone through a couple prior steps and who really have put in some time and put in some effort to, to start establishing themselves as artists and artists who show. What Boston has that's really great, and I kind of imagine that this exists in, in a lot of cities, I, I hope, is artist associations. And joining an artist association often gives you the opportunity to show whether or not you belong to it multiple times a year. So you can belong to it and then you'll have talks. They do things like this, for instance, um, that I've been a part of multiple times. And they'll often have um, shows a couple times a year and that you can submit work to. You won't always get in. So like if you're someone who's just slapdash kind of like doing whatever, like don't think that like just because you're in the association that gives you like an automatic yes. But um, it gives you the right to kind of submit work for a show usually. Then galleries like myself, a commercial gallery or a co-op gallery, um, will offer calls for art. And they're actually calls for art all over the U.S. at any given time. And that can be another time to submit your work. What you're trying to do is build yourself a resume so that when you are talking to someone like me, that you're saying, I already know what it's like to show. I've shown at this place, this place, this place, this place, and that you have some sort of like track record already and that you're not just someone who's been painting in your basement and then are coming to me saying, I don't, I don't know anything about this. Teach me everything. Because the problem is, is like, I have worked with people like that who are incredibly talented or like have worked in other countries and have never worked here in the U S for instance, and have that talent, but that is incredibly rare. The, you need to do most of the teaching to, for yourself. Like you have to learn this yourself. You can't expect someone else to try to kind of like take you by the hand and guide you through the process. There's a ton of information online and there are lots of ways to kind of like access it. Um, so what you want to do is try to figure out as much of this as you can through experience rather than kind of through asking someone else like what you're supposed to be doing next. Um, and part of that experience is literally like listening to a talk like this. So if you're listening, good job. Um, <laughs> yes, like this is, this is good. And what you can do next is figure out where is this art association? Where is there a library in your town where you can show work? Like that's another great thing. Think about like who owns your paintings and then make a list of like what cities they live in and then start making a CV for yourself where you list like any, you can list like what art classes you've taken at the top. It doesn't just have to be like if you got a master's in fine arts. People will say, oh, I studied under this person. And you can put that at the top. You don't have to say you studied under that person for like two weeks or whatever. You can, you know, make yourself like a, a nice little CV and then um, you can start and then you can create a website. Most artists need a website or an Instagram. You need to be able to like be found. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't, you know, like I said, even Instagram or Facebook, just like some sort of online presence, I think is important as well. Um, and then like that, it's kind of like that getting out there process. So like an artist hasn't like put themselves out there in any way, like they're not ready to work with a gallery, I'd say. What do you think about that, Mo? Mm, I would say if you belong to a special social group, they might just, you just find doors shut. That's it. Let's say a, a Turkish artist mm -hmm. in Germany is not as advantageous or as an equal opportunity as a German artist in Germany. Mm -hmm. So the more this Turkish person with a high school degree tries, the more frustrated this person could be and could realize that he really had no chance. Mm -hmm. So what do you suggest to artists who are in a clear social financial disadvantage that who might find um, all the doors and windows are shut in a way. W what other 
uh, strategic steps this person could take? So this is going to be much more like very international advice as opposed to American advice. And I think that's one thing to note is that my experience is very American experience. Art is a place where particularly these days, like we are looking beyond, let's say the typical white American male. Um, But I understand that that's definitely not the case everywhere. And I would say that First of all, one thing that's really hard when you're talking to an international audience is for people to understand that one of the most expensive things about art is shipping it. And it makes it so that I get inquiries from artists in like the Ukraine, in Russia, in Spain, in France, and they're like, do you want to show my art? And the answer isn't necessarily that their art is bad um, or that their art is good. It's almost irrelevant because getting it to me is going to be so much work. It's not worth even going down that path. And so I really encourage people, unless they've sold a piece, and then you can figure out shipping afterwards, right? But to try to stay as locally as possible, when you're talking about physically showing your work, I recommend that's why I'm saying like art associations, if you can't find an art association, why don't you start one? So that's another thing. Start at your Turkish Artist Association in Germany. I mean, that sounds amazing. Don't let doors, shut doors, be an obstacle to you. There is always ways to go around them. Imagine that that door is shut, but imagine that there's no wall around it and you just get to go around it. Um, That is very American advice, I realize, but it's also try to take that can-do attitude and see what you can do with it. Um, So for instance... Ask your library, say, if they've never shown art before, say, well, why can't we show art here? Um, You can put art, and this is something that people do in America, you put art in your home and then invite people in to show it and see it. Yes, everyone may need to wear masks, but like people, there was a guy in Boston who did that and started his career as a gallerist by doing that, by curating a show like in his house and in his garage, and then like moved down to New York and like has a gallery in New York now. In Beijing, there was a, uh, I think now there is not anymore, but there was a very famous um, courtyard gallery called At Home. Yeah, it was a, a very good uh, experience for both the, the art enthusiasts and the artist galleries as well. Um, but in many places, unfortunately, it is illegal to sell art without a license. Here in Spain, if you carry your art in the street, you get fined immediately. You're not allowed to sell, um, to make money from your art unless you have paid a full social contribution as as much as a lawyer or doctor would pay. Wow, okay. Yeah. So artists, doctors, lawyers are the same in Spain, but in Germany and France, they have a discounted rate, I would say one third cost of uh, other Mm -hmm. professions Mm -hmm. and they can sell legally. I came to Spain. I was like, why don't you just do it? You know, carry your art to the street. And they're like, you want to go to prison? (laughs) Try. (laughs) Like, I I like to see you try. (laughs) The mentality is, mm, in a way, it is um, through years of conditioning. Mm -hmm. And America has definitely the can-do mentality thanks to the liberal market policy. So the artists, I guess, in America are more open-minded to try things, like you said, at home gallery style things. Well, maybe people in other places, they were less um, passionate or less dare to think Mm. about the alternative ways. But definitely we shouldn't be limited because now there's internet, right? So Can they sell via the internet or is that still... Um, subject to the same fees Uh, it's subject to Mm. the same fees unless they are the citizen living here like spanish citizens living in spain they Mm. can sell up to five thousand dollars one year um, without license that's the citizen's right so if you sell let's say each piece five thousand you sell so two pieces a year then you have to pay that social contribution depending on the age situation it's like three hundred um, 400 US dollars per month oh, plus okay. VAT, which is 21% yeah. plus the personal income taxes, which yeah. is not a part of the license. Right. 
Well, at least yeah. the VAT would could be added on to the price of the piece, but um, yes, the, right. Yeah. <laughs> but the rest yes. of that, yeah, that'll put quickly eat into your profit. But yeah. I guess the good <laughs> yes. thing is, is that if you if you think of that five thousand dollars as being like a cushion, it would allow any artist to kind of get themselves started. Yes showing things online in a way that could get them a, a an audience and feel like they could be an artist and then they could worry about the next steps after but that again goes back to kind of like probably having to pay for those social contributions with another job that they have if this artist sells online um would you still work with this artist as a gallerist that gets so complicated. I have two different contracts. I have the contract that's like just for consignment of certain pieces. And well, we'll go into that first. And that would be like, these pieces are consigned to me for one year. And so like, then the artist can't sell those on their website. If they have them listed on their website, it would just say like, buy this piece through Beacon Gallery. The other contracts that I have are for rest representation and that representation is usually for all of new england because the u.s is so big and we're so close to new york what i don't want to do is stymie my artists careers like if someone wants to show their work in new york like the last thing i want to do is like keep that from happening so like our goal in a way is to have them have a gallery in new york because that would be amazing and i'm not in new york so we are new england but then exclusive online if they get a gallery somewhere else, we, we, we can like kind of renegotiate that. But they should, they're, again, not supposed to be selling any of their stuff online. Everything comes through me. Studio sales come through me. Everything comes through me. Um, so they're not allowed to sell anything like on the side. It works out okay. It requires, and this is something that like I completely believe till the end, and I have to work this way, um, is that you have to trust your artists 100%. And I will not work with someone I don't trust. So I give all, I give my artists like as much leeway as they need and trust them. I give them all the names of the people who bought their pieces. As soon as like, you know, they're being paid for them, they have all that information with the expectation that they're not going to go behind my back and try to sell them more. Um, but so that they can add them to their email list, for instance. You know, but a lot of um, galleries like won't, they will withhold that information. But I feel like that creates a, a sense of mistrust. And that's not, that doesn't create, like, I want to work with people that I, that I like and that we have a healthy relationship. But I don't think that that fosters a healthy relationship. It's a very risky move for the gallerist. I give them as much rope as they need to hang themselves. And then I fire them. But what about if the artist has a day job? Would you discriminate artists who has a day job? Oh, no. I mean, I have, I have a lot of artists. <laughs> I have artists who have day jobs and artists who don't have day jobs. It, it's just one of those things where, like, they either, you know, need to do that or they don't. As long as they can, like, get to the pickups and drop-offs and the art's good, then all is well. Aren't you worry about not having, you know, fresh productions? Um, that can be frustrating. And, um, but I will say that production can be hindered by a lot of things. So let's say all of a sudden you say to me, would you not take an artist who has children? Because that would hinder their production. Think of how that sounds. I have an artist who has a day job who's probably one of my most prolific. I have another who um, has children who is one of my slowest. I have others who don't have jobs who are really slow and others who have jobs who are really fast. I think that every artist kind of just works on their own schedule and you have to decide if that schedule kind of like works for how you work as well. Do you have like a minimum requirement for an artist to deliver X amount of pieces every year? Because I've met artists in three years did one work, huh? I schedule my shows with at least 18 months beforehand. Sometimes I'll get inspired and I'll like usually try to leave like a block or two free here or there for someone um, in case something exciting, like a, a great idea comes up or who knows what. The artists are expected to have the work when the show 
is coming up. And so that's, that's really what I care about. So like that artist who creates one work in three years, like that would be a problem unless they've been working for 30 years and they have their 10 works and that's all we're going to show, I guess. But remember, you also have like, unfortunately, one of my artists passed away this past summer. And so it's now it's like, I don't have any new work. So I just have what he has. And we're going to do a retrospective of his work. But a lot of it hasn't been shown. He's not, he's not that, that well known, but I think his work is exceptional. And we're going to put together a show. And so I think as a gallerist, you don't always get what you want. You can have some control in the sense of choosing who you do want to work with and being aware of what types of artists people are. And don't expect an artist to change for you. I never expect artists to change how they work or what they're making. I let artists do whatever they want. And I, I've been told that I'm exceptional in this way. I don't tell artists what to make. I kind of like give the space over to them and their ideas and support them to the best of my ability. I do try to, ha I select the work and, and hang the show, but I don't tell them like, oh, this is what's going to sell. This is what. Because you already decided to work with them. So you let them free because it's already chosen. But what if, because I saw on your website, you also do the portfolio review. Mm -hmm. And what if an um, artist comes with his or her portfolio and you saw potential, you knew that he or she could be successful um, commercially in your gallery, okay. but they need to change one thing, just one thing. Would you tell this person, change this one thing, you can work with me and you might be successful? I would suggest it, probably. Um, but I wouldn't make them change it. So it wouldn't be a condition. Like you want to work with me, you do this change. You wouldn't do that. I want to be clear. So I do these portfolio reviews. And one of the biggest things that I tell people is that it's not about trying to get to work with the gallery. So those are like completely separate service that I offer, but it's not about getting me to, to look at your work so that you can potentially work with the gallery. However, I did, I looked at someone's work let's say this is kind of like a good example of what you said though. Um, and this was through a different art associations portfolio reviews, looked at her work, really liked it, but her pieces are all enormous. They're all like five or six feet by, you know, five feet by five feet, you know, three feet by six feet. And I did tell her that I would recommend she do some smaller pieces as well, because those would be probably more sellable she would do well to be able to make smaller pieces or to try that out. And she did. And they look amazing. Uh, like you said, a portfolio review is not a way for you to say, you know, review and work with yeah. me. If that is not the, the way to approach, what is the way to approach a gallery? Well, so first of all, I offer this portfolio review service and I charge for it. And so I just, it would be completely unethical of me to like, have that be how I like try to get people into the gallery or like told people like, Oh, you could maybe get into the gallery. If you try, if I, I think you understand like why I can't, I can't do that. That's for you. But many people, uh, in a way do it. And there are a lot of online competitions, even, uh, galleries or platforms run online competitions. And the entry fee is like 10, 20, 30 bucks. You're spending your time and your time is worth something. If I pay for art tutor, even after the teaching session, I didn't learn the technique, but the professor spent her time sitting down with me, you know, is the exchange of service. I think even that would be fair. That's my personal you know, sure, uh, sure. way to look at it. But of course you have a higher ethical standard and you say that's not okay. But what other ways artists have to approach a gallery then? So first of all, what you want to do is look at galleries that have a similar style to, or kind of like concept to what you're doing. So you're not going to want to go to like the gallery that's only showing like 19th century impressionist work and you're like some sort of like conceptual artist and like go to them, right? So you want to find the right type of gallery and then you can cold email them. I don't mind getting a well-crafted email. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Well-crafted. Yes, we receive a lot of emails are like... Just the subject has one line, half finished with grammar mm -hmm. mistakes and spelling mm -hmm. mistakes on the body. There was nothing. 
I've gotten things that are supposed to go to different galleries. I get things where I'm like the BCC, you know, I get things like Dear Gallery Naga, which is another gallery in Boston. And I'm like, yeah. if, if people have written like a nice email to me or to like Dear Beacon Gallery, at least, and if I have time, I will usually respond to them. Alas, the response is like 99 out of 100 responses are, I don't have space for you. And I don't have like, you know, you're not right for the gallery. I have taken someone on off of a cold email. Rosa Leff, who is a paper cutting artist, whose work is amazing, sent me like a random email. And I looked at her work and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I invited her to be a part of a show. Stranger things have happened that like you could end up with something good happening if you if you send these emails out, but you have to have something behind the email. And so oftentimes I think what's best is a website because some people are hesitant to open um, Word docs or PDFs for fear of viruses, whereas a simple website, like easily navigable website is usually your best bet where you just have like your portfolio on there that people can click through and see what your work looks like. A well-crafted email uh, with the correct, at least, direction. <laughs> yeah, not a group email um, with a strong work and a good way to show the work behind. Um, but don't you think many people, they couldn't really see themselves from outside? How would you define the artists that work in your gallery in three words? Oh, that's a that's kind of a hard question. So yeah, um, contemporary, conceptual, alternative, I guess is like my my three words. If I'm a basketball team and I'm recruiting new players, and I say minimum one meter ninety, right? So you're one meter ninety or you're not. Uh, but with artists, they say, oh, my work is so conceptual. It is so abstract and it is so contemporary. And you look at it and you're like, what? That's the opposite. Like, yes, I get what you're saying. They have no distance from their own work. Basically, an artist in China, he would uh, peel the trees, the bark of the tree and try to find pattern like, oh, this looks like an elephant. Oh, this looks like a monkey. Use it like a bread crumble and then make it a shape and then frame it directly. So that's rather a craft. That's, you know, very nature, very, um, uh, in a way, uh, aboriginal. But then he described his work as very contemporary, very conceptual, and very abstract. It's nothing of the three that he was describing. But how would you recommend artists to better look at their work before approaching a gallery? So that can be where maybe a crit group could be helpful. Do you know what a crit group is? Yeah, like 10 people and they were all art school graduates. They criticize each other's works. Those kinds? Yeah, but they don't have to be art school graduates, but like just getting a group together of artists. It's kind of like if you have a writing group, right? And you all like every, or your book group. So your book group is going to like read a book and then talk about it. Your writing group, you all come with like your chapter and then everyone talks about it you would get together and you'd bring your piece of artwork and everyone would kind of like talk about the art. You can even all make something there. You can have a model and, and all draw or paint or whatever. But I think that sense of community can be really helpful for artists. And that's something I think that art school offers that structure, right? And, and the critiques I've heard can be really, really tough for artists. But you don't have to go to art school to get that. You can do it through an art association. You can also do it on your own. You can find a few other artists who are willing to talk to you. Just go online and ask that question in like a local group on Facebook or on Reddit or wherever and see if you can get a few people who are willing to meet up at like a coffee shop or like library or wherever someone has some space and and talk about your art and maybe even come up with that like how do I describe my art? How can I best describe this? What do you, is this conceptual? Is this more craft? Is this like, what is, what is this? What have I made? The other thing that I would recommend, um, just to go back to your point about like, how do I approach galleries is figure out if you know someone who's in any of the galleries, like as artists, often artists will know other artists is getting a recommendation. So everything is about networking in life. 
alas, and unfortunately, for those of us who move places, for instance, where we don't have any networks, which is incredibly hard. So you move to a new city and you're an artist and like, you don't have any network, that's tough. But then that's how you got to get into that art association, get, find a crit group, things like that. And you start meeting people, go to openings. But if you have an artist or even have a gallerist that you've met or talked to, ask them, where do you think my art would fit? Is there a gallery that you think my art would be good for? So I'm talking to, I'm doing one of these, um, the, these sessions with someone where I'm going to look at their portfolio in a little bit. And if they ask me that question, I have in mind a couple of galleries that I think are the most appropriate for this person. And then what they can do is say, this person suggested that I contact you. And all of a sudden you have their attention of the gallery, the reader of the email. Cause they're like, Oh, I know that person. And they suggested it. Doesn't mean anything more will come of it, but it's another level of like an in, and then even more so if you get them to actually write an introduction. It's all about the networking, if you can, if you can work it. Yes, uh, networking is great for uh, in most of the places. Um, in continental Europe, it's more difficult because here it's, uh, it's about genetics. The social circles are, are tighter. Um, but definitely, like you said, getting people to criticize your work to have a distance. At least you know what other people are thinking of your work. But would you recommend them going directly to the potential collectors, potential collectors, not artists, and let them judge? Would you buy my work? Is that simple? You <laughs> spent money and buy my work? My work must be good, right? That's a little bit too bald. But what you could do, though, is have, let's say you create your art association or your crit group, then you could bring in the a collector or two one evening and have them and talk about their work. You know what I mean? Or talk about like, and have a conversation with them. And you never know where it'll go. Or those are the people that you have like judge art contests or art calls. And, and like, you have to kind of create, it's all about creating relationships again. No one wants to buy work that just for the sake of buying work. People want to feel like there's something behind it. They want to have an emotional connection to the work, to the person. They want to feel like they're supporting a cause um, or that they're going to get some sort of like return on investment. They're not looking to just, you know, take something off the wall to, you know, at your studio to put up on a wall at their home for no better reason than you asked them to. Well, there's another approach is the more like the, the art print approach is use big data and from the Google Analytics, you can see what people are searching. Let's say uh, art for my salon, abstract red portrait girl, uh, <laughs> things like that. Um, they were not really looking for emotional connection. They just want a red thing on their living room, maybe, maybe. But that in a way is something, their emotional connection is beauty. So it's like through the eyes, right? So they're saying, I want a red, they, they, they know what they want. It's this red, whatever that they want. And then you said, here's this thing that you want. I, you know, so there's this, um, in, a, in a way it's a match, right? It's not, here's this random, you know, thing. Do you want this random thing? Right. You couldn't take any like piece of artwork and give it to them. They knew exactly what they wanted and you were able to provide it because they did the search. And as a gallerist, you knew this kind of information. Would, would you like uh, translate this kind of market information into your own criteria when you select artists? I wish that I could. <laughs> I wish that I could. I'd probably be more successful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> maybe selling out every show. The reason I started the gallery was for my own, because I wanted to have a business but also for my own curatorial desires that I wanted to put up what I wanted to put up on the walls. And also I wanted to educate people about certain causes in terms of social justice. And so as interested as I am in selling art and I have to sell art to keep the doors open, it's really about so much more than that. So what you have to imagine is that I have to find or the collectors have the right collectors in a way have to find me as opposed to like me going out to like 
these collectors being like, buy, buy my art. Um, people have to like engage with the concept that I've created. And I'm still trying to find that full audience. You know, you have to full, find that audience via the search engine optimization and through the shows that I do and through media and through marketing. And it's not easy. But if I was just trying to craft shows to follow the zeitgeist, it would um, be A, exhausting. And in America, things move so fast that you couldn't possibly keep up in my opinion. And it also wouldn't feed my spirit. It's not like what I got into this industry to do. It was never to kind of like help people find a piece to go over their couch or to have them like find the next like fashion artist, if you know what I mean. It's much more the long game. I'm, I'm running a marathon here. It's not a sprint. I have seen some new galleries. They don't necessarily have a big space or not space at all. But what they do is they try to use big data because now with the pandemic, more people bought online and then more data in art. And they were already that in other industries, but in art were very limited, but now there are more. And they're trying to go to different platforms, every single platform, like Artsy, Artnet, and you know, Artsfair, you name it, every kind of platform out there. And they represent artists, like they're trying to make it like a sushi train. They just feed, 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 and then it just goes, goes, goes. And the, they're trying to um, fish with a net, right? So they spread it and then try to catch whatever there is. So you're doing the kind of opposite. You're not trying to get as many attention, sell as much, and to do the uh, quantitative way, but you're trying to do it the qualitative way. I mean, maybe it'll work for them. I don't know, but that's incredibly, like all, all of those platforms cost money to be on. Yes. So you're yes. putting on like a ton of resources in, into doing that. And the same thing with like uploading all that information, again, that data, like that takes a ton of time. I don't think people realize how much it takes to like just maintain all of the information on all of these platforms is incredibly time and resource intensive. So part of it is, is, is potentially like I have to do it a certain way because it's just me and it's probably also, it is, it goes along with like my personality and my desires. I think it's also um, how, yeah, how I want to run my business. I, I really want to have authentic connections with people. I'm not trying to run an online business. I'm not trying to be like, you know, the Amazon of the art world where I'm just shipping out art to, to random people around the world. I am always delighted when I get an online sale. I mean, that is like, it's like Christmas come early when I just see that pop up in my email. That's great. But if that was all my business was, it wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. I love writing the catalogs. I love writing about art. I love meeting my artists. I love when people come in and I get to talk to them about the shows. If there were a great, very talented artist in front of you, likely in front of the, the screen right now, um, and they have a lot of potential, they have the eagerness to, or willingness to you know, show their art and put it out there for people to appreciate, to buy, where are you bringing them in their, in their life? I think that galleries really offer um, structure and consistency and uh, a methodology and how things can be done for artists. I think that, um, first of all, artists are usually best off when they can just work on their art, right? Being successful really requires doing so many other things. And it's really nice if you can just focus on the art, not worrying about the marketing, the sales, the this, the that, the other. And so that's where galleries can like offer value. Like the things that I can offer that a lot of artists don't seem to do and that I would recommend to any artist starting out, for instance, is to um, keep a record of all the art you make from the get-go with like a photograph and the title of the piece, the dimensions, the year, the materials, the price and like that sort of thing and keeping yourself organized is so hard. I mean, I struggle with it too, but I also try to work to get other people to do it. But like keeping yourself organized is one of the best things that you can do because going back and working on it later is so much harder. And um, 
that is probably the number one piece of advice I can give is, is just like working on that structure. And then as a gallerist, when, what you're doing by offering shows is again, offering that, like that end point of like, this is something that you need to work towards. Here is your, um, here's your due date in a way. And here's what you need to, you need to produce everything by this day. And that gives artists a time to work towards. It's like, it's crazy where artists will often kind of like have some sort of block until they have something that they have to work towards. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, I have to, I have this thing that has to be done by September 1st. And then, you know, come June or July, they're, they all of a sudden either have inspiration or create it for themselves or just start working and somehow get there. And that's another way that I think galleries or, or at least I am able to kind of like inspire. And I think that's a good thing to have. And that's something that artists can create for themselves though. So remember, if you create a show or that sign of artificial deadline of like, I'm going to have an online show, it's going to go up on, you know, January 1st or something, then you can also create it for yourself if you have that level of structure in your life. But it's for artists, it's a, a steep learning curve to go into the commercial world. The more difficult part is many artists who think they are made for art galleries, yet they are not. There should be some sort of a, it's almost like a career office of a university when mm -hmm. the students comes in and say, you know, I might want to envisage my life this way. And the career office is like, okay, pursue a job like this with the current skills and major and minor. Here you go. Try to pursue this part of the job in this sector, in this industry. Um, and many people don't have this opportunity to kind of get their initial advice. You know, am I uh, made for or should I work with a gallery? Should I work with a, a, a public institution or should I sell it online and be my own gallerist on my own? Just to make a small announcement is that uh, we are launching a, a Patreon a slot or a, a, a place. Opportunity opportunity for a uh, monthly consultation. We have only one seat. I think it would be a good way for an artist to know, you know, if they should pursue this route or not, uh, because this will be with you. So um, yes. who should be um, coming to you and, uh, you know, asking you for advice? I think just like what you said, I, someone who um, maybe is a bit lost looking for some information. Um, I mean, I'm happy to work with galleries as well who are looking for to kind of like chat about um, their work also, but um, artists and the like who are trying to figure out like, what is the next step? Where am I going? And, um, and we can kind of try to suss that out. I often find that back planning works really well, which is why, yeah, talking about where do you want your work to end up is a good place to start. And would love to sit down and talk to whoever, whoever would like to. I've talked with several artists who had this uh, almost like a, a, a buffet way of looking at career planning. And they want them all like, oh, I want my work to end up in a museum and I want to work with commercial gallery, but I also want to sell it on Etsy. You know, it's like they want too many things and they don't see the sales channel conflicts. We cannot have it all in life. And if you need me to tell you that, I guess I, I can be that person who can tell you that. <laughs> I can help you to see maybe where your art might belong. I will try to be gentle. I, I tend not to give feedback on. So one thing I don't do is usually tell people if their work is good or not. Do not come to me to find out whether your work is good. Um, that's not what portfolio reviews are about. They're about that. That's almost in the eye of the beholder. It's much more so about like where to place your art to get it to the right people. So whether those people are going to be, yes, like Etsy or institutional or working with a commercial gallery, or maybe setting up something yourself. I am always happy to brainstorm about 
new, different, unique ideas and hear about like the specific challenges that your community might have. I mean, I'm very aware of what's happening in the Boston area in the U.S. Mo talked a lot about what's happening in Europe, which really opened my eyes a lot, I think, to, um, to how things are more complicated and different there. I have my own insights into Asia, having lived six years in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, so I'm really interested to know what are your difficulties and, and how can we solve them? So it was, yeah, lovely having you here. So I will leave the links of Beacon Gallery and the you know, link of our Patreon in the description below. So just check it out. And if you have any questions, just leave us the questions in the comment box below. And maybe one day we can organize a, a live with live audience, live call ins. I love doing this sort of thing. So happy to do it again. This was so much fun. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. I will stop the recording here.